Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Genesis Clan Wars by Simon. Cool mini or not. It's a two to five player game that takes roughly about 60 to 90 minutes to play each different campaign mission. There are multiple missions in the game and you'll go from one mission to the next, proceeding until you finish the campaign. In the game to Genesis Clan Wars, you were either playing as a ragtag group of heroes working to progress through the Protectorate and defeat clanners, or these bad guys, these villains that are all controlled by a single entity. Uh, it is a uh, one versus many style game, so 1v1 or 1v up to four, where one player plays as um, the clan the bad guys, the swarmers, feeders, and warriors, whereas the other players are going to play as these different heroes. Each hero is going to have their own unique character card, as well as HP slash passives, unique abilities, and a card to start out with, utilizing their edge tokens to take actions, giving it to the DM player, and then that player will have the opportunity to react to them. That player can actually choose to hold on to these tokens and wait until the most opportune time to react in maybe one, two, or up to even three times, or maybe four, um, against the players, utilizing their characters, traps, and decoys to the best of their ability. Throughout each of the campaign missions, the players are going to try and complete objectives and finish their objectives in a timely manner before the bad guy, the DM player, actually tries to complete their objectives. The DM player plays kind of as a neutral role in certain aspects to make sure that the players have enough information and can utilize their information to come complete these missions, but at the same time trying to defeat them with the knowledge they have at hand as well. Will you, as the Protectorate forces, attempt to say, stave off the clanners and defeat <laughs> the villain in uh, D-Genesis De Clan Wars, or will you uh, be the bad guy, the villain, and utilize your forces, your swarms, to defeat your foes? So there are a lot of videos out there circling on YouTube now for the game to Genesis, explaining how the game is played, there's playthroughs and all that. I'm going to give you a rundown of the basic idea for setup, basic idea of how the game is played, and then we'll come and talk about my review. So, how to set the game up. The first thing you do is you determine how many players are playing the game. Each player that is playing the game will choose to either play as one of the good guys, one of the ragtag heroes, or will play as the dungeon master, the clanner, the guy that plays all the different swarmers and feeders and warriors. Once you have assigned each player with a character or a role, uh, then basically the characters um, who are have been picked by the players, such as like Echo and Timur and Pluto, will get one of these these booklets here. These booklets are going to contain their character card, are going to contain what I can essentially call passive abilities slash HP that's called potential. They're going to get uh, one of these edge tokens. They'll get a number of different or a variety of different items that they can utilize and they're going to get an operative actions like player aid. Once each player has gotten those and set them aside, forming this little area on their game board, the villain is going to set up for the mission. There are two book booklets in the game. One booklet is the rule booklet that explains the game, which hopefully the main DM player, the person who probably knows the game the most should play as the bad guy. And he will go through the mission booklet. This mission booklet will have a multitude of different campaigns or missions that will go through a campaign. And uh, they kind of have branching paths that you can take. You always start with the first one and proceed from there. Uh, so I want to end up the first mission here. And basically in this booklet, it will tell you what tiles to utilize, how to attach them, where the spawn points and objective points and exits point, exit points are, and the starting space for the operatives. Make sure you place all the characters that are playing as an operative in the starting space, and then utilize these markers here, which will be indicated as like hidden bad guys. All these villains that you see in the corner here actually start off as hidden, and you'll place them on the board based on what the booklet says. Sometimes this information will be public, sometimes it will be private. Once you have placed all the tokens as the villain and made sure that the uh, good guys have placed their characters on their starting space and the board has been set up, set aside the dice, set aside all the villains, all the extra tokens, and all the cards that you might utilize for that specific scenario in the campaign. That might be tarot cards, additional items, in memoriam cards, which are basically like a you are dead and here's a specific and fate to your character, and other such cards that you can utilize. Your main game board for the villain is going to be this, like, hidden kind of DM screen, which will not only hide your resources, hide your tokens, but also will give you information regarding each of your different 
characters that you can use, your, your feeders, swarmers, warriors, and potentially even a unique villain character that you can utilize. There's also an area in which you're going to be util utilizing for scheming, which is when you're going to be taking edge tokens from other players and utilizing them. And there's an edge reserve, which is where you give those players their edge from round to round. Uh, anything else can be set aside that you're not utilizing and just give the main player, the DM character, a hostile actions player aid. Both are both uh, the cards are double-sided, which explain abilities and actions, and uh, then you're pretty much ready to go. Um, it's a pretty simple, straightforward setup that's fully explained in not only the rulebook, but the campaign booklet as well. The only thing I do remember, suggest, highly suggest, is make sure that your most knowledgeable player plays as the DM to start with. Okay, how to play. So because the Genesis Clan Wars is basically a tactical game, a slight amount of little bit of area control, combat style game, you'll be going through this mission booklet from one scenario to the next. And actually, here's a little example of how you utilize the uh, operatives going through the mission treats. First blood, which will then go to the tip, tip, tip of the spear, and then in which case you can either push to Lamb of the God or directly down to River of Dread, then to Lamb of God. And so these are like the scenarios in which you can partake in and in which order you can do them in. You'll flip over these booklets, you'll read through the introduction uh, to the players, to the operatives, and then you will begin the First Blood mission. This is the booklet for First Blood, the first portion of it, which will give you the briefing which you will explain to the players. From there, there's a cool, unique intel phase. This intel phase will allow players to spend their tarot cards. These are ability, one-time use abilities that are very powerful that you can turn in to gain bits of intel. Um, uh, it's a way that you can allow your the bad guy to gain powerful effects, but also you gain valuable information. They can sometimes give you useful like clues, tips, and hints as to what you need to do because some of your objectives are loosely not explained as you go throughout the game. From there, you're going to be uh, looking at your um, events and objectives here. Some things will be explained, some things won't. There's consequences. This is mainly for the DM to kind of keep track of. Maybe it is that the all the protectorate forces are trying to destroy all the monsters. It's the, a general, like, you know, kill all the dudes on the board type of thing. And maybe the villain is attempting to infiltrate the secret layer of the protectorate civilian forces and destroy them before they get removed themselves. I don't know, there's a bunch of, uh, there's a variety of things that can happen in this game because of how it is made. And all the forces start off hidden at, for the bad guys. Uh, so... Each of these objectives can be kind of different and unique and difficult to like grasp as you go through utilizing the story of the game. But from there, after you've done the intel and given the players what they need to know and set up for the game, you're going to move on to the full, the full setup of the game board, which should be at this point done. I have it done here, but basically this explains the setup of the game. Any special features, which are like unique objectives that pop up, for instance, like there's the wall, there's certain pieces. In the game, these little uh, items, they are miniatures that will go onto the game board in certain locations that can affect certain players based on what player goes there and interacts with it. Sometimes maybe you'll get an item or maybe you'll find a trap or perhaps it's going to be a useful wall to protect against the enemy, right? And so this booklet will kind of explain what happens in those cases. Um, and then, of course, after you finish this campaign, you'll move on to the next one and you will go through it. They'll have another setup. It'll explain all this good stuff. So it's a rinse and repeat type of thing. Go through your intel and then give out your edge tokens as the DM, one to each player. Uh, depending on the number of players playing the game will determine how many operatives they're going to be utilizing. In a three and a four player game, each player, each character uh, is limited to one uh, edge and one specific character, in which case in this game, maybe I just remove these two guys here. And this game, actually, the play is pretty simple. How it works, and actually it's really well detailed in the rule booklet, is there are two rounds that kind of, they, it kind of rinses and repeats. There's a number of, there's like a round table that the DM will use if they need to. But for, for instance, it's just here. At the beginning of each round, the hostile hands out a number of edge tokens to the operatives from the edge reserve. And each edge allows an operative to take a turn. The operatives may use their edges in any way, in order, any order they choose. So Bill can go, then Tim, then Susan, or Susan, Tim, and then Bill. It's really up to those players. Uh, the, the number of edges handed is based on the number of players. So in this case, I have a three-player game. So it's one edge per operative. And after each turn is concluded, if at least one operative still has an edge, the round will continue. If all operatives have taken their turns, the next round begins. And any effects that last a single round end. 
um, and we you know, take, take place at the end of the next turn or carry it out. If there are any effects, and the operatives are handed out another set of edge tokens. Well, so as each of them plays uh, their actions out, uh, they are going to hand me their tokens as the villain, and I have an opportunity for what is called a reaction phase. So, for instance, if Bill takes their turn, they give me their edge token. They perform their, their two actions they get. I have this edge I can set aside for my scheming area, and after they're finished, I can actually just play this token. I'm also able to wait, and after Susan takes her turn and gives me her edge, and then Bill, I can hold these tokens and then I can react. And I can take one, two, three, or even four turns in a row, depending on the number of players playing the game. But either way, I can never have more edge than the number of players, and if all players run out of edge, then I, and I choose not to react, I can then give each player edge tokens, and they're gonna rinse and repeat the round. And that's basically how the game goes. Now, how a turn works, like what do you do when you give an edge token to the DM player? Well, basically you can take two actions, and it's really nice, there is an operative actions sheet here that tells you what you can do, and I'll go over them really quickly. This is a very basic, like, uh, the style of the scheme is very similar to a lot of other like tactical turn-based games as far as actions go. But one is that you can move. You can move usually up to two spaces. There are cards and characters that can change this, but in general you'll move two. How the terrain is set up will affect how movement works. There are spaces that are encircled or highlighted with white. That is like the highest form of terrain. And then gray is the next highest and black is the lowest. You can always go from high to low, but going from high, low to high will cost an increased amount of movement. And it's by plus one. There's also difficult terrain. You can walk into it, but it's gonna be a plus one movement to walk in, but it gives you plus one defense. And then there's sometimes there's obstacles and terrain items that can give you defense defense as well. Uh, as far as line of sight goes in this game, it's literally just point at any space in your area to the area you wish to connect to and check to see if your range matches that location and if your location can touch that location with a straight line. Movement is two spaces and you'll just simply move your character into the little coordinates one at a time. Uh, the next thing you can do is scout as long as your character is on the focus side, which is pretty cool actually. Your character actually has two sides. He has the focus side and then he has the primal side. Primal side is the red side, focused is the kind of like yellow side. Um, so when you're in the focus side, you can scout. You'll check the number of spaces away that you are from a current um, villain or enemy token and you will roll dice from your focus pool. You can roll a number of dice. It, it'll, I'm not explain how that all works in a second, but you roll a number of dice from your pool, check to see if you succeed, and then if you do, you'll flip over these tokens, revealing them. So there's a benefit to the bad guys having hidden tokens on the field. So by revealing slash scouting them, you can kind of gain the advantage in this way. Speaking about the boards and how you can flip them over, there is a flip dashboard action, which you can flip from focus to primal. So I can go from one side to the other, which will change my pool of dice. And it'll also change my abilities to a certain extent. Echo here will switch from being an optimized defensive unit with a sensory sweep and overhead the edge radar to suddenly now he can scramble, discharge, and he still has the over the horizon radar. Uh, but his pool will change as well. He'll get different sets of dice. And there are three sets of dice in this game. There are white, black, and red whiter lighter and not as dangerous black are a little bit more challenging and then red are dangerous but very very good so the amount of successes increases with the complexity of the die and the amount of botched faces on the die the next thing you can do as opposed to flipping your board is you can do a bare-handed attack it's a primal weapon attack in melee range you can do a melee weapon attack which is also typically primal you'll attack in melee range a range weapon attack which means you'll use a specific item that item will have a range on it. This guy here is a, actually it's interesting, this one here is actually a focus weapon, um, but it'll have a certain number of attack dice on it that you can utilize. Um, it kind of includes that into your die pool. A number of range markers from where you are. So if you're shooting with a gun, you can maybe shoot more than one or two spaces away from you. And then a unique effect or ability that happens when you trigger this. Now, with, with rolling for weapons, there's kind of an interesting aspect to it. Remember I talked about these die having botched faces? Uh, the white ones do not have botches, but then the black and red do, and there's more botch faces the farther along you go. So when you roll these dice for an attack, 
If you get a botch, your roll will be unsuccessful, which means you'll actually flip over your given item that you're using and you'll suffer any consequences from that item. Whether it just be that you can no longer use it for now and maybe you have to reload it for later. Maybe it blows up the space that you're currently in and does damage to all players around you. Um, so on and so forth. Here, your action phase ends, flip this item at the end of the round. So you just lose your action phase, but then you get this thing back. So there's a variety of things that can happen when you're rolling for combat, whether it be ranged or whether it be melee. Uh, so sometimes a barehanded attack might be necessarily necessary, but kind of a necessary evil because it's not as useful. You can also roll for your active trait. It's a specific unique trait that you have on your character board that might do something unique for you. There's mission related actions. Maybe you have to uh, carry a survivor and uh, cross them over the finish line to some extent and that costs an action. You can pick up or trade items and then you can also drop items, but you can do this as a free action. Um, the same action can actually be taken more than once because remember whenever you give away one of these tokens here, you can perform two actions of your choice. So you can move, move, you can melee attack, and then range attack, you can attack and then move. It's really up to you how you utilize your two actions for your specific edge token that you're giving up to the bad guy. And so that is how that works. Now, when the bad guy gets this token, the bad guy will actually do an action for the characters here. And the character's function is very, very similar in that way. You'll discard one of these guys here. And my actions are to move, typically to spawn at a valid spawn point, and I'm using this marker to illustrate the spawn point here. Uh, what units you can spawn depends on the campaign, it depends on the specific scenario, and how many you can spawn. You can only have a number, a certain number on the board. Uh, and then whether you, can, you attack, you can use a trait, mission-related actions if there are any, pick up, trade items, or drop items, which are also seldom used kind of. These guys are kind of swarming dudes that just kind of want to go in there and wreck some havoc, which get more advanced and more complex as the missions progress. But typically you'll be moving, you'll be attacking, and you'll be spawning new units utilizing these tokens here. And that is how the game is going to go. It's going to go back and forth up until the point where somebody reaches their objectives, in which case something might trigger for a new objective or the campaign might end triggering the next campaign. Sometimes you might need to beat one campaign to move on to the next. Sometimes there might be a penalty or something that another player, the other faction receives when that campaign ends or the mission ends specifically and, and so on and so forth. It goes from there. You might utilize these tarot cards throughout the campaign. You'll be drawing new guys. Sometimes you can just use these as a bonus effect like plus five defense for you or any ally this round. Very, very powerful. Um, and you might acquire new items as well. There's a stack of items that you can utilize like pistols and grenades. There's unique potentials and whatnot that you can pick up. Um, but that is how the game goes. Uh, the last thing you need to know about combat is pretty simple. There is an attack, this is a dice pool, there's your defense, and then there is the range of your weapon. Whenever my Echo gets attacked, maybe he has a defense of one. Uh, if the enemy attacks Echo and, ha and rolls dice and does more successes than the defense, Echo will take damage. And that damage is not dealt in points here. It's more, it is dealt in points, but it's dealt in a unique way. It affects the Echo's potential. And Echo has two potential to start with. He has a white noise and download. When Echo takes the damage, he will flip one of these cards over. And now he only has one potential that's, that's remaining that is useful as a passive ability. When the next one gets flipped over, Echo still has these two HP points, but they're no longer usable as their potential side. They no longer have those passive abilities. When one goes away, there's only one left. And then when the other goes away, you are in memorum. That means your character has died. And in some cases, players can pick you up. There's certain negative effects to having to pick up a character. You can also revive players, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how these guys work. Whereas the bad guys are actually a little bit more simple Bad guys mostly have just one HP, and when you reach, when you roll the dice with your character or an arranged or a melee attack, and your attack is higher than their defense, that sad little character goes away. There's a bunch of unique little combat tricks I didn't talk about, like what happens when a hidden unit walks into a space and ambushes you, or when you're able to scout out this thing, basically you'll reveal it, and if it's a decoy, it goes away. If it's a trap, it goes away. If you walk onto a trap, it will trigger, and there are trap aspects on your board that explain what happened. Uh, there are a bunch of different characters, and each of these characters, the, the, the swarmers and the feeders and whatnot, will spawn in place of some of these tokens here, and they all have their own unique effects and abilities, and they also have their own minis that represent them. So they only start off as hidden tokens, but eventually will be revealed, and there's benefits to ambushing players 
uh, or there's benefits to revealing the enemies before they have an opportunity to ambush you, but they all go away in basically one hit. So that's basically the idea of the game. There's some other little aspects which I'll kind of cover and talk about how they work, um, but for the most part this is a tactical, mission-based campaign scenario type of a game with the unique aspect of flipping your character boards, utilizing potential that's also life, that also has passive abilities, trying to work out completing your objectives in the best possible way you can and using this best, like the most tactics you can as well while the evil lurks and decides whether they're going to utilize your valuable edge tokens all at once or go back and forth with you. Yep, so there you go, the Genesis Clown Wars. What, so what, what are they with the game? All right, so I'm not gonna lie. I have not played a Simon game in quite some time. I've been interested in playing the new Zombicides because I own the original, which is the only one I've ever played, and I bought the heck out of The Other's Seven Sins. I love that game. I have literally everything. I've painted most of it. It's a wonderful game, but other than that, in Blood Rage, I haven't really covered a lot of their games, which has been actually kind of a disappointment for me. So this is actually great when Simon came out and reached out to let me uh, take a look at this game here. I love mini games. I love dudes on the board. I love Amerithrash games. I love tactics games. And this has a whole lot of all of that in this game. It feels a little bit like the others in that sense of moving around and completing missions and utilizing your characters. But this one is a heck of a lot different. This has got a little bit more of a an edge to it, if you will. Edge tokens, haha, <laughs> funny joke. But it's a little edgier. It's it's a little more deep thought that you have to take into like consideration where your characters go, where other everybody else is gonna move. You have a bunch of characters uh, and each player is talking about their individual character and that character is you and you don't get other new characters that pop in. This is the character you're utilizing for the mission and you need to utilize him as best as you possibly can. Use all of his potential resources to your benefit and work against the evil player. Um, which is similar in the others as well. There's a lot of similarities between that game and this game. What I also really love about this game is the hidden characters. All the hidden things, it could be traps, they could be decoys, they could be maulers, vanguards, stingers, archers, rangers, helions, beastmasters, snatchers, trappers, and cacklers. Or you might even actually run into like a gendo or a spider. These are like unique characters with their own unique cards. Some of them actually kind of are like a boss-like mechanic where they start off as a specific character and then all of a sudden you defeat them once and then they turn into a different, not, not, not a different one, but like a different form. You have not bested me, now I'm in my ultimate form and all of a sudden now you have to deal with the, the, the last form of the character. In which case, eh, stage three is more of like the character has suffered lots of wounds and so it's a more realistic boss fight, but he does have a lot more hit points. So uh, there is a sense of uh, depth strategy and a little bit of kind of like a grandiose scale where you're fighting against an insurmountable amount of forces moving in throughout the desert terrain of the Protectorate to defeat them and secure your objectives. And each of your characters are not only kind of, they're all kind of lone dogs, their own like own individual characters. They all have their own kind of like religious sect as well. And they're kind of forcibly working together to complete the goal of like, you know, the Imperium, basically. That's kind of the idea. Um, we're, the, we're playing, my, the DM is kind of playing as like the Tyranids. They're kind of like a bunch of like crazy dudes running around like taking care of business. I don't know if they're necessarily as like intelligent and whatnot in what they're trying to do. They're just, maybe they don't like the people coming onto their land and they're trying to deal with them. I'm not exactly sure how it all works, but it plays really well. I love the idea of flipping over my board as my character and instead of like the others where you get corrupted and corruption increases your power and potential and makes you more dangerous, this is more about like choosing what side of like my alter ego do I want to be on my primal side or do I want to be on my more focused side? What do I want to utilize and how I'm going to utilize my, my potential for my best abilities? Am I going to trade off tarot for the ability to gain information? Or is it best to save these powerhouses of cards to utilize during gameplay? Am I gonna stick to the high ground against Anakin? Or am I gonna go down into the trenches and combat melee style? Am I gonna be focusing on trying to reveal everything, scouting as much as humanly possible? Or am I gonna go in there and just go fisticuffs? Now, there's usually a best answer to these situations and a lot of it comes down to being tactically sound. You never really typically wanna go into a bunch of enemies that are currently hidden because you do not know what they're going to do. And if you walk into a bunch of melee units, you could be torn asunder quite easily. You don't have a huge amount of health in this game. And so it's all very tactics driven. It's all very play the game smart and make the best decisions while at the same time, 
anticipate what the bad guy is going to do, what this main DM player is going to do. Are they gonna utilize all your potential, all the potential that you've basically given them or your edge tokens at once, to which case they'll move all of their units in and just do a ton of damage. And you can be seriously injured if you're not very careful, if you do not like position yourself correctly. Even on a more simple mission like the first and even second mission, these missions can actually come down to the wire if you're not really careful as operatives. Now, in my opinion, yes, it starts off a little easier for the players to understand the game. There's not as much complexities, not a lot of extra items are brought in, but it progresses from there. And I actually, this is a prototype. So everything you see here is a prototype. Things will be changed, things will be added. Not every mini is as you see it, most likely. Not every token is gonna feel and look the same, and the boards will probably be different, probably maybe double-sided, etc. Obviously, this box will be changed as well. But Overall, as far as the quality of this game, this is a prototype and it is a damn good one. It looks great. The quality of the image, the quality of the pictures and all that good stuff, is, it all looks wonderful. The miniatures are excellent, which is expected of Simon at this point, and they do not disappoint. They are all really highly detailed, really nice quality miniatures. I'm not worried about falling around on the table and becoming damaged. These things are going to be just fine, even in their more prototype form. Love the quality of art, love the style, love the immersion, it all feels good. I love the idea of uh, unique intel phases and objective phases and things happening in the campaign. You're not just running around shooting things, which, I mean, I love that, actually. <laughs> but, but I know for some players it's not as much, of, much fun unless there's more added to it. The tactics, specifically choosing the best spot for your character at the best possible time, utilizing resources as cover, being able to interact with the terrain and aspects like when I played the game Hero Quest, the, the, the newer revised one, it was just so cool to like be able to like participate in the map itself and not just feel like my dudes are fighting other dudes on a brown surface. This actually provides with more story theme and objectives that happen and make you feel like you're interacting with the world itself. If you like games like the others, if you like tactical like style, like singular turn combat games from like the video game perspective, X combat kind of stuff, I think you're gonna dig the Genesis Clan Wars. I really like this game. I'm actually excited to play more of it because I was given a limited amount, but what is here is excellent. Overall, a high quality, what you'd expect game from Simon. The only thing is, is do you wanna play a game like this? This game does require a bit of setup. There is a lot going on. It's not overly complex, but there's a lot of options and each option matters heavily. If you make a mistake in this game, you are going to suffer from it. The, the bad guy is going to make sure that every mistake costs you dearly. So making choices is very important in this game. It's a heavier thinker, it is tactical, and it is very smart. And that sounds like a good thing, but I'm just saying for some players, it might not be the greatest thing. And depending on your player group will determine whether this is gonna be a game for you or not. For me and my table, everybody that really likes these type of thinky, heavy games that are both crunchy for both players, and both players feel like they, both Sides feel like they have an opportunity to win. So if this all sounds great to you and you're interested in taking a look at Genesis, there's a link down below in the description. I really, really like these type of games. Well, thanks for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game, The Genesis Clan Wars by Simon. Cool mini or not? No, they're, they're very cool. Um, I love these style games and I think you will too if you've probably played uh, a Simon game before and you like tactics, this is gonna be up your alley. Uh, this is a uh, link down below. It's on Kickstarter, but I believe, or GameFound. I believe the, whatever the link is, it's one of the two. I haven't looked at the campaign fully because I just want to show you guys what I got here. And I wanted to play through the missions that they gave me to take a look at, but I'm sure there's more content, a lot more content. And you can look at there. I think the campaign just ended. We just got this game in about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. So you have the opportunity to see what else they have, what else they've contributed to. But yeah, overall, so good, so good. And if you think that we've done a great job here, if you've watched more than one of our videos here before, if it's your first time, thank you. But if it's not, maybe you wanna consider giving us a subscribe, hit the subscribe button, the bell notification button. We do greatly appreciate it. We also do live streams every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST, where you can watch us play games literally just like this one here. And in fact, we might do this one at some point on one of our live streams in the coming weeks. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I look forward to defeating you in the Genesis Clan Wars next time. Cause I'm gonna beat these guys. These guys are freaking sweet.